All right, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Kyle Wall, and I will be talking about hypertrophy as the answer to chronic pain. So starting out with some pretty bold claims right off the bat here. So hopefully I can help you guys out with this uh, population and helping these clients get a little jacked. So we'll go to just a little bit about myself. So I, I'm a physical therapist assistant, strength and conditioning coach, as well as a certified personal trainer. I've been doing this for over 10 years, a little less with the rehab stuff uh, in physical therapy, but I've been in the industry for over 10 years. Uh, I've got a background in functional patterns, postural restoration, functional range conditioning, uh, ASTEM, muscle injury techniques, FMAT, like you name the acronym, I've probably taken the course or done it. Um, so I, I got a lot of experience with this and really I use this uh, experience to help me build out what is wall personal training real creative name, I know, uh, but it's really where I focus on helping active people who are in chronic pain that are keeping them, that's keeping them from being the best versions of themselves or training at the level that they want to, and really just trying to guide them through that process and get back to, you know, everything that they want to do. So, and I built it out really just from personal experience as someone that has been in the gym and, you know, is just a bro lifter at heart. I've had a lot of injuries uh, from disc herniations, hip impingements, labral tears, pretty much everything you think of, uh, which led me down this path. So I've got a lot of experience, both both personally, as well as uh, as a career. So uh, that's just a bit about myself. And, you know, today, I want to talk about how, you know, again, how hypertrophy, I think, is the number one thing we should be doing for this chronic pain population. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to modulate pain and to uh, get rid of pain, but I found that especially for those that have had pain for longer than six months, 30 months, this is probably the number one thing they need to be doing. Um, so I really want to go through what I believe chronic pain is and the importance of hypertrophy in relation to it, how to retain program for, <clears throat> as well as help people in chronic pain. Uh, so, you know, hopefully help you, you know, make your clients happy as well as maybe make a little bit more money on the side, right? And, and then as well, just kind of talk about how hypertrophy can be trained simultaneously with, you know, mobility, uh, improving someone's posture and their injury rehabilitation. Uh, and then lastly, just provide some principles for exercise selection, uh, load management for the chronic pain population out there. All right. So we got a lot to cover. Uh, we'll start with just some basic sort of uh, definitions, I guess we'll say. So what is hypertrophy? You guys know this. Uh, you're probably like, okay, like, wh what is this? This is, uh, you know, personal training one on one. But hypertrophy is basically you're just scaring the crap out of your body. You're threatening it so that way it can make the muscles bigger and stronger and more resilient overall, right? So pretty simple. We all know this stuff. Uh, what are some misconceptions about it, though? Well, there's quite a few, and these are literally uh, misconceptions or things that I've heard from chronic chronic pain populations, as well as just people in general, when I say this scary H word hypertrophy. Uh, but one of the first ones is hypertrophy training can cause, you know, damage to your joints, um, which I think is just utter bull crap. I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss on this presentation, so I'm going to keep it PG, but uh, it, it's, it's awful, right? So hypertrophy training, um, though there is always a risk to any type of training that is out there and moving your body, uh, it's definitely probably the safest thing that we can be doing at this point. If you think back uh, thousands of years, the only jack people that were out there were either like warriors who somehow lived through all the battles and got pretty dang lucky. Uh, they were huge or, you know, it was the alpha Tonto out there in caveman wood or caveman uh, times who just was blessed both genetically as well as, uh, you know, hopefully was eating the most food or anything like that. So the fact that everybody can come out here uh, into a gym, into any sort of fitness facility and train and eat an abundance of food, which we know is a problem nowadays, um, it, it really goes to show like how far we've come both as, as you know, a species, uh, but that everybody can be doing this. And it is in relation to what we've gone through in the past as a species, uh, probably the safest thing that we should be or should and can be doing at this point. So, uh, and two, like just go watch a uh, Dr. Mike Isertel video about full range of motion training. This also gets into uh, reducing some of your mobility stuff, but we know that hypertrophy training, full range of motion, it's probably one of the better things that you can be doing for your joints 
and getting that connective tissue stronger, uh, as well as building up the muscle and making just a more resilient human. So that's like the number one misconception I always hear. Number two is that you got to batch squat, deadlift, bench press to see any progress. Again, we know that if you do any exercise with progressive overload and you're probably eating well or you're in the beginner stages of your training, you're going to see some sort of growth. Are there better ones for you to do like a bench press or a batch squat or a deadlift? Of course they are. Uh, these are amazing movements and th this is not to discredit the uh, compound lifts, but it's the fact that we can pick out any exercise for pretty much anybody out there. We can make something up and probably see some sort of tissue adaptation over time, right? So it doesn't, you don't have to have your clients just do this. Uh, and then, you know, the third misconception is that it'll make you reduce your mobility. You know, I got Ronnie up here. I'm sure he probably had trouble. Actually, I, I, I'm pretty certain from the documentary, he had trouble touching his shoulders. You know, this is a, obviously an enhanced athlete who is the pinnacle, right? Him, Sebum, all these guys in the bodybuilding realm. Yes, they do have reduced mobility, but they probably have an extra 50 at the minimum pounds of mass to them that is at literally getting in the way of their mobility or their joints. What we're talking about here is hypertrophy, like get some beginner gains for this chronic pain population, get, you know, seven to 20 pounds of muscle. Um, that's not going to reduce your mobility. That's not going to get in the way of your joints. And I truly believe that the unless there's a genetic component to this, like you, most people I've ever met uh, have not lost any mobility from adding muscle mass to themselves. Uh, so, you know, it, that's, that's really kind of how I'm looking at this. But uh, the fourth misconception here is that if you don't look like Ronnie or Sebum, you're just wasting your time. Again, these are enhanced athletes. These are guys that are at the top of uh, what they do. And if you don't look like them, well, one, you're probably not enhanced. And two, that's not a problem, right? We're just trying to get you moving well and be the best version of yourself. And so when you say the word hypertrophy, uh, it doesn't have to be always related to these enhanced athletes, which I find happens very often. So um, chronic pain, right? Like what is this stuff? So it, this is where things can get a little bit funky because it, it's a very big like umbrella term. Uh, is what I've noticed. So uh, chronic pain is, and this is per the CDC, uh, it's any pain that la lasts longer than three months, three to six months. I put six months in there because that's what I personally learned in school. But this is, the CDC actually says three months, which I think is pretty insane. Uh, that any pain longer than three months is considered chronic at that point. Um, during 2021 alone, 20% of the US population, that's 51 million people experienced chronic pain. So you know, you're thinking there's 12 months in a year, they at least had three months of that where they were hurting for that extended period of time, right? Uh, I guess one thing I didn't, I couldn't find clarification on is that like, does this count headaches or migraines or like a chronic stomach ache or something? I didn't notice that, but I am assuming that most of this is like orthopedic or like joint pain, things of that nature. So, uh, you know, again, one in five people are dealing with some sort of pain in their body uh, for anywhere longer than three months, right? Which is pretty crazy, uh, at least in the United States. So that's a lot of people. You're going to run into these people at some point, especially in a training and especially in rehab because that's your job. Uh, chronic pain is linked with depression, Alzheimer's, uh, suicide risk, substance use or misuse, as well as sedentary lifestyle and loss of function relating to like activities of daily living. So that's like, man, you can't get up and down. Uh, the steps you're having trouble reaching up into a cabinet you're it's reducing your lifestyle at this point let alone any sort of training so you know that's a lot of people that's a lot of people that are dealing with this stuff uh common misconceptions with chronic pain right there's a a good amount of them out there uh, i would say the number one thing is that chronic pain is constant tissue damage so uh, i guess one thing we do need to talk about is that chronic pain past the six month mark most of the time depending on the injury and the individual, but most of the time, anything past six going into eight months is from a tissue standpoint, probably healed up, right? Like think you got a scratch that takes anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on how deep it is, um, tissue damage or like ligaments some, or connective tissue or like ligaments, tendons, those take a little bit longer to heal up. Um, and depending on how bad the injury is, or if there's something like really bad that happened, 
Uh, but tip, typically it's healed by like month eight, right? The, the tissue is good to go. It can be loaded. Uh, so this pain is something different, though you're feeling it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually re-damaging that again, right? I had a disc herniation uh, back in 2020. It was good by month eight, yet I still had pain going into a year and a half with that. So it's kind of like, well, what, what do we do with this? And that segues well into like, well, then it's all in your head. And again, this chronic pain is not all in your head either. So it's not necessarily you're re-damaging the tissue, but it's all not just made up <laughs> uh, at this point. So what that chronic pain really is, is it's just, it, it's a different thing at this point. It, that initial pain you might've felt is not the same as probably what is happening now. And that's molded into something completely different due to, you know, guarding symptoms, your beliefs around it, what you've been told. You know, people will be like, well, you got bone on bone. I know I hear that all the time. And people will think that's a lifetime, you know, diagnosis there. I got bone on bone in my knees. I can't do this squat. I can't do X, Y, and Z, right? I'm just not, I got a bum thing for, I got a bum knee for the rest of my life. And we know that that is not true. And that's a, something I'll do is just kind of like a test for people. I'm like, all right, well, what I want you to do is just sit there, close your eyes. And I want you to relax every, like if this thing's in pain, I want you to relax every muscle around there. Relax your stomach, relax your leg, whatever it is. Does that feel better? 90% of the time people are going to say, yes, that feels a lot better. And then as soon as they move it, it hurts again. And so I'm like, well, you have like, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know that that pain can get better. And a lot of the times it's just getting mobility and getting some movement and relaxation around that joint. So that pain it's not a lifetime diagnosis. It's not in your head. It's just a, it, it's speaking a, it, it's a different language that your body is um, communicating with and trying to bring attention to it. It's a typically a pain that's associated with like increase in muscle tension and guarding and, you know, that joint being under a magnifying glass, if you will. Uh, and it's very focused on that area and it doesn't want you to ever hurt it ever again, like you previously did potentially to the point where you can do something good for that joint. And it can even deem that as bad and painful or a threatening um, stimulus in some way. So, you know, this uh, this pain, it, it, like I said, it's kind of like a different language. It's like you go to the UK and you hear their accent, but then you move from the UK all down into Louisiana and they got some Creole sound to them. And you're like, well, well, I can't understand a word they're saying at this point. So we may need to figure out a way to translate or get used to what the body's telling us uh, in this different accent or this different dialect um, that the body is utilizing at this point. So a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, the last one here is just kind of chronic pain is due to poor posture and a sedentary lifestyle. I don't buy this uh, as someone that uses posture as an assessment a lot of the times. Uh, I definitely don't buy this. I find that poor posture and a sedentary lifestyle are actually side effects of chronic pain. So, you know, you've had chronic back pain and then you start to present with a sway back or you present with an anterior tilt because your back is hurting all the time and you're trying to find a way to offload this tension or pressure or pain in the area, right? Uh, the other one is the sedentary lifestyle, your back hurts. You can't take your dog for a walk without it hurting. So you stop walking the dog as much, right? So that's typically how I'm uh, viewing these things. They're just more of a side effect of having pain than the the cause of the, uh, the pain at the end of the day. So uh, last little bit here is just chronic pain is not the same pain again as the initial injury. Like it, it's something, it's morphed into this complete different thing. The initial ankle sprain you felt probably felt however way at first swollen all of this but now six months later eight months later by the per the cdc three months later that pain might feel completely different and it could spread it could go up to your knee it could move around and all of these things and just kind of rationalizing that and saying wow okay like this has changed this is different can start to help people you know understand that it that pain that they may feel isn't in their head or that it's not causing tissue damage. And that can be very, very empowering at the end of the day. So uh, again, just some misconceptions about pain. So now we have a pretty good idea, you know, what is hypertrophy? What is not hypertrophy? Um, or, you know, the misconceptions around it. Same thing with the chronic pain. We have an idea of what it is and then what it's not uh, here. So just kind of typical chronic pain. 
uh, timeline. Again, imagine three, six months here, this is all happening. So you have a painful event, you twist your ankle. If you're smart, you go to the doctor or, and you hopefully go to like physical therapy or chiropractor, whatever it is. And you talk to some kind of professional to help you out a little bit. Uh, the pain gets better or maybe it doesn't, uh, but it's not quite fixed. It's not quite there. And you're still having pain, pain presenting, but the tissue itself is healing up. Uh, and then at some point you maybe have like another flare up, you know, down the road. And it's again, probably past that six month mark personally from what I found that this happens and it kind of, you know, you didn't actually hurt it, but the body presented it as like, oh, you stepped weird <laughs> on that foot. And that's now like, we're mad. We don't want that. We, we feel under threat again. And then after that point, it's gone and it's gone. Right. And now you're really just kind of stuck in this vortex of just pain and we're worried about it from a conscious perspective from a subconscious pers perspective and this pain was just not going away no matter what type of exercise that you do um you know manual therapies all of that stuff right um so you know the answer hypertrophy in my opinion in my experience this is the number one thing we should be doing for this population and the reason why is because technically they're healed up. It's been, you know, six months, hopefully, hopefully they've been clear. They probably have had MRIs. They probably had all these different types of in imaging done. And they've talked to some different health professionals, something like that. And we know that they are probably cleared from, for exercise minus them just having pain. So what could we do? Well, we know there's all kinds of pain modulation techniques. I listed a bunch, right? There's PRI. There's manual therapies, there's ASTEM, there's all these different manipulations uh, from a rehab side. There's so much we can do, but what is probably the best bang for their buck at the end of the day is hypertrophy. I could have said strength training, but I didn't because one, it didn't have the same ring to it. <laughs> uh, when you say hypertrophy and chronic pain, they just seem like they're on two different planets in a lot of ways. And say strength training, that's a little bit closer to um, chronic pain, but, but someone might confuse maxing out the band and a clamshell as strength training, right? I like hypertrophy because it's more focused on a tissue adaptation, which I think is the, uh, what we should be really, really focused on for the population, right? So hypertrophy is going after really just getting bigger muscles. So getting the bigger muscles means you're probably going to get stronger throughout that process. Uh, you're going to get stronger connective tissue. So if you got someone who's had some labral issues, had some you know, scar tissue, all this stuff, like you want that tissue a lot stronger and getting bigger muscles. Well, as this increases in size, the connective tissue on both sides has to get stronger to resist that as well as the load that you're doing on a daily basis or weekly basis uh, to create the stimulus. You're going to get stronger bones. You're going to get better homeostatic uh, responses. So think the more muscle you have, the less at risk you are for obesity, uh, the less uh, at risk you're going to be at for heart ailments, all these different, you know, diabetes, there's, there's so much, your metabolism, metabolism should be higher. There's so much that plays into this increase in muscle mass. And, you know, again, we, we're getting an improvement in just overall resilience. The more muscle you have on you, the more, you know, adaptable you are, especially in like a, a black swan event, you get in a car accident, you have to go through a really bad rehab process. Do you want to have 20 pounds of extra muscle on you through that process? Or do you want to be skin and bones? and starting from nothing, right? So again, we're looking at hypertrophy as being the best bang for a buck. If you're gonna spend your time and your energy on anything, it should be focused around this and those pain modulating uh, modalities or techniques should be supplementing this process. So that way we can move people uh, down the road uh, toward really just being the best versions of their self, themselves. So. Uh, and one of the best parts I think about hypertrophy uh, that really isn't talked about a lot is the mental health aspects. You think as someone, you know, adds that seven to 20 pounds of muscle in the first six to 20, or I'm sorry, six months to 12 months of training, if they're complete beginner noobs, right? Those beginner gains, you can throw anything at them, anything in the kitchen sink at them, and they're going to grow, right? They can be in a caloric deficit and still probably have some kind of growth, Um but they're going to probably have mental health improvements. We know depression is an issue with this uh, population, but they're going to have increased confidence. They're going to look good, feel good. 
right? That little extra bit of muscle, you see those cap delts, you see a little bit of abs that starts to, you know, have people believing in themselves. They feel better about themselves. And then not to mention, as they have that more muscle, they feel stronger. Even if they have pain, they're still going to feel more capable than they were before, right? So again, best bang for your buck is hypertrophy training for the chronic pain population. Uh, and there's many ways to program this, but this should be our number one focus at the end of the day. Uh, I included this photo just because, you know, it's been online forever, uh, but we're seeing the adipose tissue of a 74-year-old man who is sedentary versus the 74-year-old triathlete. And it's just truly amazing to me, like how much muscle the body can hold on to when we are active and we're moving. And, you know, I can't say, I, I don't know these people at all. I don't know anything about them. I know they don't know their background. But if I had to make assumptions, you know, I can't say that the top guy was sad and the bottom guy was happy or anything like that. But I would say the bottom guy is definitely probably more healthy as well as probably more has more resilience uh, overall for health, longevity, everything else that we're looking for. Right. I can't say if the top guy has pain or doesn't, uh, but I would definitely say that the bottom fella here with all the muscle has at least stacked the deck in his favor. Uh, when it comes to the pain side of things. So uh, this is obvious. <laughs> you're probably like listening to this. If you're listening to this, thank you. Number one. Uh, number two, probably like bid red truck, like the, the elephant in the room. We all freaking know that people need to add muscle. Like if you had a client, everyone runs had this client who they won't, they have had back pain, but they won't work the back muscles. And you're like, well, if they just would like work that area, what if they added 10 pounds of muscle? What if they just got stronger? How would they feel? Like we all know this, but yet there's still one in five people who are having problems. And I can't say that's all our fault. It's not all the health uh, rehab and, you know, fitness industry's fault. It's not, you know, there's some people out there who just can't help themselves in some ways. Uh, but that said, we can be better advocates and we can be better at applying this um, strategy to get people to work harder for these tissue adaptations that is hypertrophy at the end of the day, right? Um, and so just kind of, there's an overall disconnect in the field. And as someone who literally lives in between this and both has a background in physical therapy, as well as, um, you know, personal training and strength and development and all of that. Like I, I've lived here, I've seen these, I, I've wrestled with this and how to make this better in the long run uh, for my clients, as well as just the clinics and gyms that I've worked in. So on the rehab side of things, you know, I'm going to kind of shit on, oh, I cussed, it's not PG anymore. Uh, for the rehab, I'm going to shit on both of these sides because I've made all of these mistakes myself. But on the rehab side, we are way too focused on manual therapy techniques. Again, those things should be supplementing. If you're not getting your patients up off the table and doing some kind of resistance training, you're failing them, right? Especially in this chronic pain population where they literally don't have like any tissue issues at this point. They just have pain. Like you're failing them, in my opinion. Uh, we're not loading clients enough. Again, you're not getting them up off the table. You're not loading them. You're not squatting. You're not teaching movement patterns. You're not helping the problem, right? Uh, we're also only focused on the painful area. So it's their low back. Well, let's do everything we can to stabilize the low back. I think if someone has low back pain, they should do bicep curls. I think they should be doing uh, different core stability, whatever the heck it is, squatting, deadlifting. They should be twisting and rotating, whatever they're cleared to do. And even if we're working other places of the body, that it's all one system. It's all still connected. I would rather someone with low back pain know how to go to muscle failure on a bicep curl than them do a single clamshell. <laughs> because at least with the bicep curl, they're learning what failure feels like in a safe and controlled experience. And then they can bring that same intensity to their other exercises later on, right? Uh, so only focusing on the painful area is not necessarily helpful. Again, that's a supplemental piece to making uh, someone more resilient and um, well-rounded as a human being, which this population desperately, desperately needs. Um, and then, you know, looking at this, like never create a progressive overload plan. I can't tell you, I think the only place I've ever had actually create a progressive overload plan that was in a PT clinic. Uh, and I've worked in several 
was SPT up in Washington. Shout out to them. They're fantastic folks. Um, but what they were doing is they are trying to basically get people off the table, get them moving well, and then they're immediately trying to transfer them over into fitness training within the same facility. And it worked very well. Uh, and I saw in that clinic far more decreases in pain and symptoms than I did any other clinic that I've ever worked at. So I think that goes to say, again, this is anecdotal, um, but you know there is research out there that supports this. We know that with low back pain, it doesn't really matter the exercise. You just need to move more. You just need to get up and like do something that's within your symptoms and managing that. And it probably gets better on its own in some ways. This chronic pain population though is a little bit different just because, you know, that pain is presenting long-term and they're learning, you know, in identifying with it. They have beliefs uh, associated with it. They, that pain has pushed them. It's made their bubble a lot smaller. They believe they can't do certain things. And because of that, they, you know, they're not pushing the envelope anymore. They're not pushing their body uh, to the level that it, it, it's capable of at the end of the day, because that pain, you know, if we think of the, how pain works, like you twist your ankle, well, back in the, you know, caveman days, it would have been like, well, go home. Because if you stay out here and try to hobble around, like something's going to eat you, like a bear is going to crawl out of here and you can't run and you're toast, right? So those that listened to their pain and stayed with the rest of the tribe and got help and shelter and food and recovered, well, they, you know, were able to have offspring more than the other ones that did not, right? But here in the modern day, you know, we listen to that pain to the point where it, it is not helpful anymore, right? And it continues to close us down and we need to sometimes get past that. So I think hypertrophy training really kind of opens that door up again in a safe and controlled environment, build, rebuilds that confidence, rebuild, you know, translate that language of pain again uh, for the client. So again, a little bit of a uh, soapbox there, but that, that's really kind of the main rehab disconnects I'm finding. Uh, and then fitness side, we're seeing that, you know, it's it's pretty similar to be honest to the rehab side. We're finding that people are um, or trainers are too afraid of loading an area that was previously injured. So someone had a twisted ankle, someone messed up their back uh, way back in the day, and they don't want to. You know, we we do a good job of listening to our clients, but at the same time, we need to be leaders and advocate for what they truly do need. You know, they're paying us for a service. Uh, we don't want to just, you know, bounce back the same ideas that they already have for themselves, right? Uh, so, you know, there and there's a lot of ways to do that. I'm sure everyone's had that client where you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to listen to you and what you say, whatever. Uh, but a lot of the times we can be sneaky and kind of put some of these exercises in there. But that said, uh, we're too afraid of loading previously injured areas. Uh, we're afraid of scope of practice. I, you know, hang out with a PT one day, hang out with a chiropractor one day get on physiopedia and you can look up any injury and it'll literally have uh different like stages of recovery for each injury that's out there right so disc herniation it's going to have stages of rehab and exercises that can be done or normally would be done and if this person's well past those stages and well past those timelines they should be fine that's disc herniation should be fine all you need to be doing is just helping them with managing the pain at that point. Okay. If you touch your toes, that hurts. Well, what if we only do a deadlift down to 20 degrees? Let's try that. Let's do a variation of this. Let's do a leg press, find ways to still load the area, but not to the point where it's causing pain, unnecessary soreness. And we're kickstarting that chronic pain cycle again right? And where the body feels too threatened, they need to be able to recover from this. So just kind of finding, you know, I think that scope of practice is, is important, but if they're in clear, right, they've been cleared by doctors, they've been cleared by all this, you're good to go. Like it's now just having a conversation with the client, of like what they want and where that you believe that they can go, right? Uh, we're also seeing that they're afraid to progressively overload the same exercises over and over. Uh, I know I've fallen victim to this because man, uh, I didn't want to lose the client. I wanted to keep it interesting. So I had to just throw all kinds of stuff at them. I just thrash them like relentlessly and they're sweating. Pfft, I did a good job, 
right? But in reality, this chronic pain population, like though they need a, some burners and they need some uh, spicy stuff here and there, they are probably going to need progressive overload similar to hypertrophy training where they're seeing the weights go up week over week and they're seeing steady progress. And with that, I have found my clients uh, who have chronic pain to get out of that very quickly by just adding weight and getting more confident with the same movement pattern over and over and over. So don't be afraid of that. You know, uh, I think that's a, a very valuable tool this population. Last thing, um, we only train around the injured area. We already kind of talked about that. You're scared to, I, I said that in point one, so that's just repeating myself. So this is kind of the main disconnect I think we're having uh, both in rehab and fitness. And if we could have maybe just a little bit of connection between the two where rehab specialists are loading their clients a little bit more and using less of their, and just thinking about progressive overload, right? And loading some different patterns. Um, well, we'd be doing better if we had fitness thinking just a little bit closer to rehab and thinking like, well, where are they? Like, are they actually still injured? Are they not? What are they cleared for? And then having these, you know, conversations and progressively overloading, I think we would be doing a lot better and we wouldn't be dealing with this one in five people um, that are coming in and, you know, with a bum back or chronically, you know, messed up knees or hips or whatever it is that's going on. Right. So. Hopefully at this point, I have convinced you that hypertrophy training should be what we focus on both in rehab and fitness uh, for these clients, right? Uh, just because they have a, a flare up or whatever it is, like that doesn't change the ultimate goal because we're going off of the idea that this tissue is already healed up. This pain is different and the pain is really the body just deeming everything bad. At this point, every individual is different. Every case is going to be different. But if we sort of have that mindset and we're like, okay, it's probably okay. Let's just do what you can. That can go such a long way for these people, right? So this is, and I do it on a daily basis. I did it with myself <laughs> multiple times at this point. And I would say my disc herniation was the number one uh, or the biggest chance I had to really apply this, right? And like, I, I did all kinds of special things and didn't really help the pain. The number one thing that helped the pain was me just progressively overloading and adding exercises back in. I couldn't squat and deadlift. I couldn't, you know, do the big compound movements I wanted to, but I was able to add 20 pounds of muscle and get out of pain that was keeping me from sleeping and doing all these different things. So I think that's, that's my story. That's my testament to it, but I've done that repeatedly with multiple clients. So again, use car salesman here. Uh, if you're still listening to this, how, how do we do this? How do we do this for this chronic pain population? Well, I personally find that this is like my four-step recovery plan. That sounds weird. Um, but, you know, really we're looking at mindset and creating expectations. Um, so that's like the foundation. If the people are not ready for this, they will not see improvements, right? They have to have the right mindset. So if they're coming to you and you want to, I'm lucky, like this is what I do. So people come to me with that mindset already. But if you have someone that walks in the door, you may have a little bit more of a time to like, hey, you know, I think we should do this exercise repeatedly. Let's, let's give this a month. Do this lead press for a month. Where are you going to be at? Where are you going to be at? I'm getting into the next slide already, but mindset expectation is number one. Number two is recovery, right? having them set up for success uh, with their nutrition. Are they happy? Um, are they sleeping well? That is all very, very important. We'll dive into that. And then really just kind of these top two levels here are our exercise selection and then the load management. And load management really is not that crazy. It's just progressive, like linear periodization at the end of the day. Do the same exercise, add two and a half, add five, add 10 pounds each week see what they're capable of. If they're pain-free with it, just keep slapping weight. So I kind of already answered that one and then that or already, but these are really like my big four core principles um, with this population. So mindset and expectations, right? If we really look at chronic pain, again, we already talked about how it's like pulling people in. Pain makes you want to go home. It makes you want to go home to your tribe and be safe, right? So people with chronic pain, they're stuck in that I need to be safe. Everything's a threat. 
and I can't go outside of the tribe. I can't go, I can't do the things I could do because I will mess this area up beyond repair is how their body is sort of working right now. Okay. Uh, chronic pain can make us very myopic. It's closed minded. You're very in the moment. It's all you're thinking about, especially if it's really bad. And I'd say that from experience. Um, so it is not a fun place to be, but creating mindset shifts and expectations um, can be very, very powerful in reducing pain literally on the spot for people. Uh, so I love things such as motivational interviewing, leading questions, and big picture ideas and views uh, because, you know, I, I've definitely been the jerk who <laughs> has had people in chronic pain. And I'm like, you just need to suck it up and you need to do this weight training program and just get over it right? That sounds really bad. It wasn't exactly like that, but I've definitely pushed people and I told them what to do. And I'll tell you right now, no one likes being told what to do. It's the worst thing. Imagine your parents telling you to clean your room. That's what like you telling your client, Hey, I know you're in pain, but you need to go do this. I'm telling you to do this right now. Go do this leg press. I'm sorry. You're going to lose a client, right? So instead let them figure it out on their own, right? Or through questions that you're asking. And they come to these realizations on their own. And that can sort of set you up for success in, you know, selling this hypertrophy program and doing this and, you know, working on it together to formulate a safe environment for them, right? And hopefully long-term success with reducing this pain as a byproduct of creating strong, resilient human, right? Uh, so some examples of this, or, um, you know, is your pain the same or different from the first time you experienced it? You're creating a separation. That event was in the past. It's a different pain. This pain that you're feeling now, completely different. It's not like the actual initial ankle twist that you did. It's now just this weird soreness and achiness. What is that feel like? What does it feel like right now? What's it feel like when it's at its best, when it's at its worst? Like asking these questions, you, you start to get more data on what the heck this actually feels like. And you can help this client translate that pain a little bit more. Oh, it's worse after I walked five miles. Okay, good. What happens if you walk three miles? I don't feel it. Okay, stay under that <laughs> like, or stay around there. Like, let's do this. Let's do that. And you can sort of have these conversations and ask people like, well, you did the leg press. How does the ankle feel? Oh, it's just a little sore, but it's not the burning like when you walk five miles. Yes. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a progress. You know, that's that's something we need to kind of continue to talk about. And then they start to differentiate these sen these sensations, right? Uh, the next one would be, if you had pain uh, the rest of your life, would you rather have it and become weaker or be as strong as, you know, genetically possible for yourself, right? I got this one from David Gray. You ask someone that 99% of the time, they're going to be like, I want to be as strong as possible. I'm, and, and you start to create the separation of, you know, even if I have this pain, like, at least I can do something. I'm not limited. And they start to peel away that like myopic bubble that they can create that the pain can create around them. Right. So again, you're working, you're trying to say, Hey, like, what would you rather have? This is it. Like, this is, here's the fork in the road. What are you going to do? Right. And you didn't tell them what to do. They came to that conclusion on their own. That's the important part. Uh, what do you believe needs to happen to fix this pain? That's a big one. This probably relates a little bit more to physical therapy, chiropractic, and rehab. But I love this question because it helps you figure out where this person is at, right? This person is like, well, I need to fix my anterior pelvic tilt to get out of pain. And, or I need to get adjusted every week by my chiropractor to get out of pain, or I need X, Y, and Z to get out of pain. If I could just do this, if I could just do that, or if they just say, I don't believe I can get out of pain, that's all data, right? And then you can start to have these conversations a little bit more. And it's like, well, okay, I don't think you have an anterior pelvic tilt, um, but I can give you some hamstring strengthening exercises. And I think that'll really help. And, you know, maybe we can strengthen your glutes and, oh, uh, you know, imagine if your glute was a little bit bigger, right? Like, how would that make you feel? You know, I know you have that trip to Italy in a couple months. Like, what if we got your glutes a little bit bigger? And you're starting to change the conversation and you're having fun. And this becomes a, I'm not telling this person what to do. It becomes a conversation and you guys are building a program together. And that's, 
honestly one of the most fun things about what I do <laughs> at the end of the day. I love talking through this and it's like, hey, you want to try this? Hell yeah, let's do it. You were, do you feel safe and confident doing this exercise? Do you want to try some pull-ups? Yeah, my shoulder's been feeling good. Let's try it. Let's do it. Like that's someone that is now out of that myopic, you know, pain at that point. Last one, what would life be like if you had an extra 10 pounds of muscle and worked out two to three times a week for the next six months? Again, you're getting them out of, I'm in pain right now. I'm probably going to be in pain tomorrow and the rest of my life. And they're now starting to think of, well, what does 10 pounds look like? And what is two to three times per week, like for the next six months, if I did that every single day or two to three times per week, what would I look like? What would my pain feel like? And so you're just providing like, here's a template. Here's something to follow. Give it a shot. What do you have to lose? You're going to be in pain no matter what. If it's chronic, you're going to have it. <laughs> so let's try something else. Let's try something. Let's focus on something besides just the pain and fixing it. And let's focus on, you know, just getting strong and having fun and enjoying moving our bodies again. Okay. Uh, so that's a lot of mindset stuff. You can go really deep into this. It, it's pretty crazy. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that just do mindset interventions for chronic pain. I don't really buy into that. Uh, Cause again, best pain for your buck, be a beast, be physically adaptive, all those different things. So anyways, uh, a really good book though, that I love about mindset shifts is, um, Oh, I can't think of it. And this is recording. Oh, goodness. Um, the Upside of Stress. Very good book. Talks about mindsets. I actually got that from Kyle Dobbs. I highly, highly suggest it. And it really can help sort of uh, explain stress, stress uh, as a good thing in our lives. And it, a lot of it can be connected to pain and also just this motivational interviewing style. Um, so if you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. Uh, recovery. Again, second tier of our pyramid foundation building thing that we're doing. So recovery, uh, it, it's re really the same thing as just building muscle, right? I think it's very important for chronic pain uh, to have some of these things because they can get out of whack very quickly. So the first one is just potentially being a caloric surplus, 250 to 500 calories for someone in pain, I found to be very, very helpful, you know, or them just maybe like tracking a little bit uh, in that feel of control, like, okay, I at least have control over this. I can't, don't have control over my pain, but I can control what I eat. Like that can be motivational for some people. Obviously that's different for, you know, obese clients or weight loss clients. You may want to play around with that, but that said, uh, at least like checking their protein content um, it is very, very helpful as well. And so if they're not anywhere at minimum, you know, that 0.8 grams of protein per one pound of body weight, or whatever the ratio is, like it, it can be very helpful and you bump that up and they may have more energy, their recovery improves, they can do more in the gym, they feel the weight starting to go, or they see the weight starting to go up a little bit higher and they start to gain that strength, like that might just be what they need. Uh, get seven to nine hours of sleep. This one in, is insanely important. <laughs> I can't tell you how many chronic pain people I have who their sleep is so jacked up because they either one can't sleep at all because the pain hurts them. That was me with my disc herniation. I could work out, I could do all these good things. But when it came to just laying down and relaxing, Jesus Christ, like it would absolutely kill me. And I could only sleep maybe three hours on a good night straight until I would wake up with pain, have to stretch, have to do something, and then get back in bed and try to fall back asleep. So that significantly reduced my um, deep sleep, which is where a lot of this recovery and, you know, you, you recover from the disc not the disc, um, the training that you might be doing is very, very important. So just bringing attention to this, like, obviously, like, I'm not a sleep specialist, I don't do sleep tests, but like having conversations, just be like, do you get enough sleep per night? Do you, you know, eat enough protein? Maybe try that. Have you tried looking into this as something to help you with chronic pain? Um, I, and same with like reducing unnecessary environmental stress. Think of that as, you know, I, I've had clients where they come back from vacation. They're like, I don't, I didn't have any pain. I'm like, oh, nice. And then two days in <laughs> I, to their being back at work, they start messaging me like my back is killing me, blah, blah, blah. All this is happening. It's like, well, it sounds like you don't like your job. And some, that might be something that's kind of influencing some of these pain symptoms. It's a, it's a, it's some stress potentially. So recovery is very, very important. I think of it as like um, playing a video game, like an RPG 
and you have all your like your health bar, your stamina, you know, all these different bars. And if you go out into the woods with them all low, like you're going to get jacked up real quick. Like some dire wolf thing is going to just eat you. Uh, but if you go out there and you have all your health bars filled up, you're probably going to be more successful when you go out into the video game world, right? Same with this. Get these health bars and stat bars up as high as you can every single day. And what that's going to do is reduce the stress on your body, reduce the threat to your body overall. Uh, and so that way you can at least just like check those off the list. Like I'm doing this. Those are done. I feel good. I may be in pain, but I feel good. I have energy. And those can be some, a lot of the times enough to you know create a snowball effect for this client or this patient down the road. Um, so, you know, down here, I just kind of say like, if nutrition and sleep are on point and you're relatively happy as trainers and uh, rehab specialists, we, we can't control how happy people are and all of that thing. That that's a little bit more internal, but, um, you know, we can make them jacked and we can make them confident and feel good about their bodies. So that's one thing we can do. Uh, but that said, we can grow from pretty much any exercise, depending on the load and the volume, and the amount of time, and then the reduced stressors, um, you know, that we just want to reduce these stresses in the environment as much as physically possible, right? Um, so that way, the only thing that might be a threat is movement, and then we're starting to intervene and control on that, okay? So once you have those two things down, recovery, and, and you know, they're not, they're, we're probably moving all of this as like a big line together, right? It's not like one thing at a time that you're doing with this client. It's more just having these conversations like, how's your sleep? How's this? How's that? Okay, let's tweak it. I, it's like a bunch of dials, right? Like, oh, well, your sleep's pretty bad. Like, let's just focus on that for the next two weeks until it's better, see what happens. But you're still going to train. You're still going to do this. You're still going to maintain these other dials that you have. So once that is all in place, we start to get to the meat potatoes, which is exercise selection. So my number one thing when it comes to this population uh, and trying to put some mass on them is I'm focusing on fitting exercises to your body, to their body, right? To the client's body. Um, I'm not trying to fit their body into an exercise. I, I had to get past this idea of like, everyone needs to squat. Everyone needs to deadlift. Everyone needs to be able to touch their toes or whatever. I could care less about that, right? Yeah, there's some things I think could be better mobility wise down the road, but that doesn't matter right now. What we need to find are exercises that you can do right now with little to no pain and then add weight to it over time. And hopefully with that, we're going to build some confidence and build some strength and build some tissue adaptations, which then help us then, you know, take that next step right? And to other exercises, more dynamic things, more mobility potentially um, down the road. So this is probably the, the key concept. I could care less about the exercise that someone's doing. I would rather someone do a single leg leg press over uh, any type of goblet squat or whatever squat pattern, if that means they could do it pain-free and I could load it up and there's no frustration associated with it where it's tweaking their knee or it's tweaking their hip or, you know, they... It, they can just load it. Like they just need to load the body at this point. So um, the ways I'm doing this exercise selection, right? I, I kind of have two different perspectives on it. So from an umbrella sense, I, I know I'm not, I'm fitting their body into an exercise. Uh, and that's where like the assessment comes into play. So what's their range of motion? What can we load right now? Uh, what constraints can we utilize? So machines are just basically glorified constraints. Based off of that range of motion and all that, um, I can then start to pick out exercises. So if they can't touch their toes, I'm probably not going to have them do a hinge from the floor, right? And do a strict deadlift. Instead, what I might pick is just an RDL and I might pick a different type of RDL. Who knows? I, it, it depends on the person, but I let their body and their current capabilities tell me what I need. Like it provides constraints for me to program at that point. Um, and then I'm also thinking in terms of like this kind of human movement is what I call it. And so that's really just like unilateral and alternating type movements. So, and, and that falls into this 80, 20 rule, but what I found and through courses like posture restoration and all this stuff, like when we do these alternating or unilateral, uh, if you want to look at it, there's multiple lenses you can look at this through, but unilateral training, 
say they built out some weird, uh, because of the pain, they stopped using one center of the body as much. And now they have some weird muscle imbalances. Well, you're about to hammer that <laughs> with unilateral training, right? You might see some strength discrepancies side to side. Well, that allows for you to you know, crush that, nip it in the butt right there. Alternating is basically unilateral training. Instead of like a floor press, you're doing an alternating movement side to side. That's providing compression on one side, expansion on the other. It provides work on one side and relaxation on the other potentially. And, and it's really just trying to mimic a bastardized variation of walking or gait cycle in some ways. Um, in physical therapy, they have like reciprocal uh, motions, which are known to be very helpful for like stroke patients uh, and people who have had neurological type issues. And I believe that that with some of these alternating movements does have an effect on clients with chronic pain and sort of relaxing the system while still pr promoting output from a muscular standpoint and, you know, going after those uh, hypertrophic or tissue adaptations we're looking for. So those are the two big things I'm utilizing in an 80, 20 rule, 80% 80 of these movements in a program are going to be unilateral or alternating, right? The other 20 are going to be more of the compound or bilateral lifts. And I'm trying to change that ratio over time. So it goes from 80, 20 to maybe like a 80 or a 70, 30, maybe eventually like a 60, 40 or a 50, 50. It just kind of depends on the person and their long-term goals, but it's not that we want to do away with bilateral lifts at all. It's just, they may not do well with them at the moment due to the pain symptoms. So uh, as a reduce pain, like I said, I, I crank that ratio up higher uh, and also just depending on their, their goals. Uh, it is said, or I will say with the human movements, the unilateral and the alternating, we do get a little bit more range of motion changes over time and mobility changes than we would with a lot of the bilateral movements I found. So that's really kind of how I'm thinking about this. So just some examples of this. Uh, we have this alternating reverse lunge from a box. Uh, this is a great exercise that I use for people where Again, you're just working one side, relaxing the other, right? You're getting a little bit of rotation. This can help improve hip flexion, internal rotation, external rotation, all that mobility around there. Um, and then, you know, if you use this and someone has knee pain, well, your, their knee's not going over their toes and you can start to grade how far forward that goes with it. So that'd be an example of that. Uh, and then here, the single leg machine leg press. This is our unilateral movement with a ton of constraints. This is such an easy movement. It's such a great tool. It's too easy, right? Like I can put someone on here and just have them start hammering this out and it has a great loading potential. Um, they are going to work both sides of their body, um, you know, in, in a way that can get rid of those strength discrepancies. It's just, it's too easy, right? Like why wouldn't you utilize machines uh, for something like this? So, and, you know, progressive overload, it, it's just... It's too easy. So uh, those are just some different ideas of this. I know I put human movements and over here doing a leg press on a machine. You're probably like, what the hell? That doesn't make any sense. But again, it's just from like a neurological perspective that we're thinking about this. Um, so going into the next bit, this is kind of assessment focus. Now, there's a ton of people who are giving presentations here that are going to talk probably about assessments. Um, you know, Alex Seffer is my go-to guy when it comes to assessments and range of motion testing. So if you haven't watched his presentation, I highly suggest it. Uh, but and same with, you know, like looking up Bill Hartman, Zach Couples, like these are all fantastic people uh, that are on, more on the rehab side of things, but we can utilize these assessments, active tests, testing to tell us what range of motion people have available to us and what we should utilize and then slowly work into, right? So, you know, there's expansion compression model that's out there. I subscribe to that. That's what I found to be the best in my, uh, my experience, and especially for this chronic pain population and selecting exercises. Um, but, you know, this is different than performance. So keep that in mind. This is trying to like get people past the pain threshold, add some muscle to them and then push them on their way toward performance in the long run. So again, 80, 20 rule type stuff. So for example, straight lead raise, um, you know, someone does this test and they're able to do this without cheating and compensating based off of some of the things that I've seen, you know, and they can't hit 70 degrees. Well, then why would I ever put them in a position past that? 
right? I want the, to fit the exercise to their current capabilities and their existing range of motion because I want to open that up over time versus, oh, well, they're only at 70 degrees or less than 70 degrees. Let me just shove them over here because that's probably going to act as more of a threat to their body. So for example, if they can't do a straight leg raise greater than 70, you know, I'm probably not going to have them do any types of TED lifts from the floor anytime soon, right? Doesn't mean we shouldn't train that. It just means that we probably need to start a little bit nicer, right? Let's do a box deadlift variation. Let's do some baby hinges. Let's maybe try some back extensions or just ISO holds on the back extension or something like that. Um, those different types of things. Like, let me, and that really just starts to create the thought process for exercise selection for me uh, based off the constraints of what they can, uh, they can currently do right now. So overall, uh, you know, these testing things, I'm not going to get into like my specific tests that I use because I use a lot just based off of my experiences. Uh, like I said, Alex is probably going to have a great presentation on some of that stuff. But overall, like pick your test. If it's FMS, I don't care. If it's PRI test, I don't care. I personally just use active range of motion because I find that to be closer to what people I want people to do, which is active movements uh, over time. So that works what works for me. Um, but you know, use your assessment, whatever it is, and start to use that for your exercise selection. So uh, just some other protocols here that I have or principles. Um, does it fit your body right now? Right? So, okay, you can squat ass to grass. Cool. We have a lot of room to play with. Or you can only squat to 90. Fine. Let's squat to a box. Let's do that. Right? Let's load that up. Let's add weight to it. And then we're going to test every couple of weeks to see if your mobility is improving. And then from there, we might either choose to improve that range of motion and load that new range of motion that you're getting, or we're just going to add more weight to this because I want to go for that hypertrophic effect. That simple, right? Uh, does it work to target a muscle? If someone does a deadlift and they feel their calves, that probably didn't work to target a muscle <laughs> in some way. Uh, so we may need to pitch something else out and that's pretty simple, but if people are feeling the wrong things, I know I, I find that that is a problem, especially with chronic pain populations, because I want them to, number one, feel confident about doing exercise. Like, hey, you're supposed to feel your glutes. And if they feel their glutes, that's a win. That's a hit of dopamine. That's they're correct. That's like the teacher saying, good job, <laughs> right? Uh, everyone like subtly, we subconsciously thrive on that type of stuff. So I want them to feel the right muscles and have that mind-body connection without pain being present because that's also another sensation that they're getting that's in a positive safe environment versus oh and, and you know again the example of feeling your glutes with a hinge movement right if they're always used to doing hinges and feeling pain but now they're feeling a glute working and burning which is still technically a pain sensation but it's positive that's a huge win right we're building confidence we're building resiliency in this person from both a mental health standpoint, as well as tissue resiliency, right? And hopefully getting that adaptation. Third, is it easy on your joints? Again, that goes without saying, especially with chronic pain. If it's hurting the area, it's not worth the bang for the buck at that point. Like It's just not worth it. Um, we can always find a different exercise for you. If you can't do that deadlift right now, it's fine. Let's do something else. Here's a leg press. Here's this. Here's that. Um, it's not that you're running away and working around that area. You're still trying to work it, but in a way that feels less threatening or not a threat at all to the body and the human being in front of you, right? Uh, and then lastly, is it for the muscle, you know, or I'm sorry, is it for muscle growth or is it for range of motion? So that example of the squat I use for number one, that's really just kind of what I'm thinking. So a lot of these like accessory uh, movements or like the human movements I was talking about, alternating all of that, there's some growth perspectives to it, but also it has that range of motion that we talked about, right? Uh, the alternating specifically, whereas a more compound movement, like a goblet squat on a box, and you start to load that up and they go from using 20 pounds to 60 pounds, like that's going to probably have some growth potential to it. Um, so these compound movements, these bilateral movements over the long run are going to have better growth stimulus, in my opinion, um, just because we can load them heavier over time. So it may not be, that's why we don't use them so much. And we have that 80-20 rule at the beginning.
So uh, just kind of putting that in perspective, uh, we have heavyweight, moderate weight, and lightweight. So at the start of a session, I'm running people with heavier weights. You know, they're doing that goblet squat. They're doing their back squat. They're doing heavy leg press. Uh, they're doing some bench press. And whatever they can tolerate and is pain-free, I'm going to do it. And it's going to be a bilateral movement because I want to get some fatigue going. I want to get some muscle response. Like I want all that good stuff to happen uh, and be able to push them and improve that confidence that we've been talking about. <laughs> By the middle of the session, you know, potentially secondary to uh, some different accessory movements. I'm using moderate weights and it's starting to get, look a little bit more like alternating or unilateral work. And then by the end of the uh, session, I'm using lighter weight and I'm going for probably more range of motion. So that way, if there's any exercises that I did that might've tightened them up, I'm then trying to open them up and loosen them back up. So that way they end that session with less of the guarding or, you know, we're, we're stacking the deck in our favor. So that way they don't have any pain symptoms, hopefully when they leave the gym or anything like that. So they get their range of motion back. We relax their system uh, with like controlled sort of, I'll kind of call them cool downs in some ways, but they're not like you're still lifting weights. So uh, just kind of examples of this. So load management uh, is really kind of where this goes into. So the, the very tippy top of everything. So heavy weights, we're using within existing range of motion based on their assessment. So if they don't have full shoulder flexion, I'm going to work with whatever they can. So that could still be a bench press, right? But I want to make sure it's 100% of the time within their existing range of motion. So a decline chest press for someone who doesn't, or a bench press for someone who doesn't have full shoulder range of motion is an extra or a great selection, right? As long as they can do it without pain, load that sucker up, have fun with it. So this could be a primary and secondary exercise. It's, you know, going to threaten the body, the muscles, maybe get some damage, whatever, you know, kind of, or, you know, the hypertrophic responses that we're looking for. Um, and then it's going to be probably bilateral or it could be unilateral or alternating like, especially like my favorite thing is like an alternating plate loaded press or something like that. And you alternate like that is fantastic work, right? You just load it and progressively overload. You're trying to get tissue responses and hypertrophic responses over time, uh, especially for these beginner lifters, right? Uh, second thing here is our moderate weight, right? So this is our secondary, most likely getting into our accessory movements, um, so they've got some pre fatigue going, they got a little bit of a pump, uh, and now we're really just trying to isolate more muscles. Uh, so that for this, we're hitting the lats. This is a long seated alternating lat pull down. You can still add significant weight to this, right? Like you can do some pull downs and you can get that lat, the teres muscles, like these pulling muscles all kicked in. Um, it's still going to threaten the muscles. It's still going it, to get a little bit more, maybe like metabolic response or metabolic stress, uh, but now it's probably going to start teetering towards some kind of range of motion potentially, right? Just kind of depends on how much weight you add to this. But over time, as you start getting heavier and heavier, you're probably going to reduce the amount of mobility that you're going to get from this and, um, as you did in the beginning stages. Um, now getting into just lightweight. So this is where, you know, we're doing our pump work. This is the last bit of accessory work going into cool down type work. This is arm farms, all that fun stuff that we're doing. This is definitely going after more like the metabolic stress. Higher reps is what I like to do for this. Uh, and it's definitely going to be unilateral or alternating, right? So this is a weird, weird exercise. <laughs> but I love this for getting people lower in their squat mobility, right? So someone has back pain and we're starting to get lower and lower in their squat and we're trying to improve that mobility and de decrease some the pain. This is a great one, right? They're hitting their biceps. They're getting a crazy good pump going. And they're also loosening up their back and improving their squat mobility by just getting them to hang out down in there. Uh, if you want to look at it from a PRI perspective, they're getting posterior mediastinum, expansion type stuff happening. Um, you're getting cervical rotation. You're using your visual system for your Z health people. Like there's so much happening here. And you could say it's whatever type of exercise, but at the end of the day, like, I don't really care what it is. For me, it's getting a hypertrophic response. It's improving their confidence. It's getting some mobility going. And I want that tissue adaptation over the long term. They better be adding weight to this every week or reps or whatever it is to progressively overload it. Okay. Um, so this is just some examples. So this is directly pulled out of my broken obese protocol. Um, that is a program that I have. 
And it's just kind of, you know, based off the assessments, we can see like, here's my assessment protocol. I use deep squat, toe touch some shoulder extension, straight leg raise. Um, and then based off of if they can pass or they fail these tests from doing it themselves or whatever, or me testing them, I can then pick out the exercises I think are best for them. So from a warm up perspective, I could have them do, do all these uh, and then they can maybe pick out their different squat recommendations, right? So you can't squat all the way down. That's fine. Let's use a single leg met, leg press, right? Uh, you can squat all the way down. Do a barbell uh, back squat. If you're in that middle range, you do a barbell front squat, right? Whatever is comfortable, load it up, add weight to it over time. And then this is just kind of an example of, you know, using this is a power exercise, just kind of like neurologically get people going. Uh, I just like to add plyometrics into my programming but I'm starting people heavy, right? Doing, this is alternating, but you can also see there's a barbell uh, floor bridge. So that's like a hip thrust from the floor. I'm using these heavier things where um, they might have some heavier weight um, or higher reps at first is what I like to use. But then over time, we're, you know, we're going down in reps and higher in weight to try to push these adaptations. But I go from my primary, secondary lifts being heavier down to lighter weight at the very end and hitting more like isolated muscle groups potentially. All right. Uh, so we're getting toward the end here. Thank you all for sticking along. Hopefully this is all making sense. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of introduce a case study. So this is uh, one of my favorite clients to train. She is absolutely amazing. A really just hard worker, positive attitude. So we did all that good work at the beginning of, you know, when I met her, she's dealing with like two and a half years of chronic back pain, tightness, uh, she had had MRIs, uh, she had had x-rays, there's like nothing making sense uh, as to why she would have this. She was having trouble sleeping, sitting on the couch, and you know she was doing triathlons in the, um, previously, then she switched to CrossFit, and just like nothing was working. Like she couldn't do her CrossFit anymore. She just wanted to work out, play with her kid, be an example for her daughter, um, and like travel with her husband, right? Like it, She's not asking for too much. She just wants to be a fucking human. <laughs> so uh, again, cussing in here, but anyways, so unremarkable MRI and x-ray unremarkable means it's not that she is not remarkable. Unremarkable simply means that there was nothing uh, remarkable in the MRI or the x-rays. There was nothing wrong with her. Basically, there's no disc, no nothing like that. So from a tissue standpoint, nothing's happening. There's just tension, right? So I did some assessments on her. I saw her straight leg raise was limited hip flexion was limited, thoracic rotation, and her internal external rotation was awful, right? I don't know the cause of this. I legitimately will tell you all right now, I don't know why. I have no answer for it. She doesn't either. It just happened. And it just got worse to the point where it was two and a half years of her just like suffering through this and bouncing from provider to provider and doing you know, the manual techniques and all these different things. She's all pelvic floor therapy. Like there was no reason why this really should have been happening. But yet her pain was there. It wasn't all in her head. There was significant limitations in her mobility. So, you know, I could sit there and give her what people have already done. I could recommend dry needling. I could give her foam rolling. I could give her stretches. She already done it all. So we just said, screw it. Let's go for it. Like, let's just get strong as hell. Let's get some tissue adaptations. She wanted to, you know, get her quads bigger again. She wanted to get some glute size, get some abs. And I was like, let's do it. Let's have fun with this. It doesn't need about get, getting you out of pain. Let's make this about just training and consistently adding weight. And we did. So we got her hip thrust. So this is her in the second photo. You know, you could pick out like some postural stuff going on there and say, oh, she's leaning forward, blah, 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 all this stuff. But we significantly, this is six months later. So this was January over here on the left. Uh, over here is July. Sorry, a little bit longer than six months. We started at the end of January and then we took these at the end of July. So um, in this photo, we can see, see significant gains in glute growth. Uh, her quads are a lot bigger. She's got abs. She's sending me photos of her, like uh, <laughs> her delts and like cap delts. Like she's having a great time with training. Her hip thrusts. Uh, were initially painful. We had to like not do them at all. So I was like, all right, we can't do that. Um, but now we've started them when she could probably like two months in. She's only doing 77 pounds. She then is, or she is now pain-free doing 297 pounds, almost 300 pounds on her hip thrust, which at, you know, six, three, sorry, four months ago was too painful to even do with light weight, 
right? So that's already like, look at the glutes. She's got bigger glutes. She's moving better. She's doing all these things. Squatting has gone up um, from a guarded stagger stance squat, which will be in the next uh, slide over here to full depth front squats that she's doing. So she's up from 35 pounds, which was kind of painful and weird uh, to 138 pounds now doing front squats, hinging, uh, was uncomfortable. Her hinging was awful. It was not fun at all. We had to really work on this and find exercises that she could do. And then now she's all the way up to 176 pounds. Yeah, I mean, she's just ripping weights from the floor for reps. Like it's nothing. Power cleans, 55 to 116 pounds. Pull-ups, we're going nine um, match reps with body weight, all the way up to five reps with 33 pounds. Uh, and then now we actually, I just had a call with her today and she's up to doing 11 um, body weight pull-ups, like wide grip, not neutral grip, nothing like that. And she's absolutely crushing. So it goes to show like, this is what we focused on. We didn't focus on it, the pain. We didn't focus on any of that. And now she's out of pain. Like this was her guarded, restricted toe touch beforehand. And then now where she's resting at all the time. Yeah, I gave her some neuromodulation stuff. I gave her some breathing exercise. I gave her some different things there. But she quickly grew out of those and it became more about the loading and regaining confidence with this after month one. After the first two weeks, she was feeling great. And it really was just getting back to lifting at this point. And if I would have given her six or seven months of just breathing exercises or just stretching or just manual therapy, she wouldn't be where she is today. She wouldn't have all these numbers, right? So like, what's the best pain for our buck? I'm using these leading questions for you listening to this right now. <laughs> what's the best pain for our buck over time? If you get the buy-in, like, why not go for this stuff? Okay. Uh, this is just some progressions I use. So we went from a staggered stance wall reference. So there's a foam roller at her, the inside of her knee. And I'm having her, this is actually her having a good day uh, where she's able to go full range of motion. Before this, I only had her go to the knee, right? Because that caused too much pain. So again, just another variation of that. And then we went in February and started to do um, RDLs with a squeeze of the foam roller between the knees just to kind of keep her back, right? like create some constraints and things that uh, she could push and pull from. April, she started you know, stacking weight on this. She started really starting to push herself. She's no pain, right? She didn't really have pain after the first four, six weeks, something like that. We had hit a couple speed bumps, but again, pain wasn't our focus. We just modulated, watched it, made sure we didn't piss anything off and just kept stacking weight over time. Uh, and then here in July, Again, we're seeing that she's pulling, uh, I think this was 170, 170 pounds. Um, and I had her just pull off some plates here, but now she's going full from the floor, 80 kg, no problem. Um, squats, same thing, right? We saw significant restriction in her ability to squat, and now she's able to get much lower. She can get way lower than this now. Um, and we started with like staggered stance goblet squats, just that unilateral type positioning there. Uh, February, we started to just load up bilaterally because that was some of her goals and she was having significantly less pain. Uh, and then by April, we're doing full uh, full range of motion squats from the box squats. And here in July, I mean, she's hitting PRs um, in six, seven months that she's lifting heavier than she was two and a half years before when she had no pain or these pain um, symptoms started. So again, it just goes to show like, what is the best thing for a buck? Are we here to just live in pain and try all these little neuromodulation things and, you know, manage the pain or would it be better off just trying to get the tissue adaptations in the long run? Okay. So in summary, uh, you know, again, thank you all for uh, sticking with me at this point, but current pain uh, populations need muscle mass. Like they need it uh, significantly, especially if they are detrained or they haven't trained before. They need to push themselves and they need to create some adaptations in their body um, to get them out of this myopic, closed, you know, uh, everything is not, nothing is safe in this world, you know, body of theirs and pain that they're in. Right. Uh, and so we as, health and fitness professionals, we can give this to them. And the main thing is like, we need to start with communication. We need to sell them on the fact that hypertrophy and strength training, all this is safe. And 
you know, we're going to work together as a team to move you in the right direction. Is there going to be pain? Probably, you know, there's not one time that uh, my client here told me like, oh, this wasn't uncomfortable. Like this, this gave me trouble, blah, blah, blah. Especially at the beginning, like we had to find the exercises that worked, but I created trust. We communicated well. She had a positive outlook. We figured out, you know, what this pain actually was versus what it initially was. And because of all that foundation and com good communication, we were able to see the, the results, you know, in all of her weight training, her glutes, her muscles, like getting bigger, all this stuff and moving her out of pain to pain-free living and training at this point. So it starts with communication and creating a safe, positive environment. Two is making sure that people are eating and sleeping and are at least kind of happy. You know, with this client here, uh, her big thing was sleep. She couldn't sleep because of her back pain. So we worked on that. We That's really what the uh, some of the other exercises and rehab type stuff was, was for, was just getting her to relax there a little bit more. But I just, we had these conversations of like, where's your protein? You know, how's your sleep? I can't really sleep well. Well, we're going to watch that over time, but really try to focus on making this better. And let's see if that'll have a positive influence, right? Let's turn this dial up a little bit if you can. Number three, select exercises that work with the body and uh, the person's current mobility. She didn't have a squat that could get this low at first. That simple. I'm not going to force her down there. Instead, I'm just going to create a safe environment, create safe loading for her where she's currently at. So a box squat was the best way to do it. She had a little bit of strength discrepancy left to right. So I started seeing her a staggered stance like, like she's doing right there. And that worked our way up to these full range of motion, pause front squats that where she's setting a PR, all right? And then passively load these movements, um, or I'm sorry, not passively, don't passively load, uh, progressively load these movements over time to get jacked, confident, more mobile, because more mobility will come with training within your mobility. I know it sounds backwards, but it starts to open that up over time uh, and just become more resilient. Right. We want to just push these people to be strong, resilient humans. And, you know, what comes with being strong and resilient, being jacked and having some muscle to you. I've never had anyone get mad at me for, you know, getting bigger glutes, having some abs or having some arms and delts. Right. And that's coming from chronic pain uh, populations right there. So with that said, thank you all so much for listening to me vent about this. I'm very, uh, you know, after living this and just being, um, in this for such a long time, I feel like I truly have a hold on how to help people or at least get them in the right direction when it comes to chronic pain um, and just helping them become better humans. So again, thank you all for listening to this. Uh, I am providing a code here. So if you are interested, uh, this VS 2023 uh, at checkout at my gum road, this will give you 20% off both of my programs, my sway batch solution and my broken obese protocol. You can find me on Instagram at wall fit. That's just my last name. Like I said, uh, wall, wall personal training, real creative name here. Uh, that's my um, website and you can find me there. So thank you all for listening and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of these awesome presentations and yeah, I'll see you guys when I see you.